So talking more about the cyber issues and international conflicts, we have an outstanding speaker today. And she's an eminent speaker who will discuss the topic of international cyber conflicts and global cyber norms. Josephine Wolf is a faculty of cybersecurity policy at the Fletcher School at Tufts University since 2019. Her research includes cybersecurity incident management, international internet governance, cyber insurance, and cybersecurity workforce development. And she has had two books. Her first book, you will see this message when it is too late. The Legal and Economic Aftermath of Cybersecurity Breaches was published by MIT Press in 2018. And a new book is coming out in 2022, which is the Rethinking Risk in the Age of Ransomware, Computer Fraud, cyber, Data Breaches, and Cyber Attacks. Her writing has appeared in Slate, New York Times, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and Wired. And prior to joining the Fletcher School, she was a faculty at RIT, where I do a lot of research work with. So I want to thank her for coming to this event, and we look forward to hearing an outstanding talk from her. So a round of applause for Jennifer, for Josephine. Thank you. What I most like to do when I speak about cybersecurity is first demonstrate that I don't know how to use computers at all. So let me see if I can get my slides up. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you, Sanjay, um, and, and everybody who spoke this morning. Thanks to all of you for being here. It's such a thrill, not just to be back at in-person conferences, but honestly, to be at a conference hosted by a state government, to be hosted in particular by the New York state government, for people like me who spend our entire lives studying cybersecurity policy and thinking about the ways that policymakers can influence this landscape, it's been increasingly clear over the course of the past five to 10 years that much of the most important work that's happening in this space is happening at the state and local level. And I promise I don't say this everywhere I go, but it's very clear that New York is a real leader in that space and that a lot of states right now and a lot of cities and local governments are looking to New York and using what you're doing here as a model for thinking through what should we be doing, what should the next sort of set of steps that we take, where should we be investing resources, um, and that it's been an incredibly powerful force for good all across the country and even more broadly across the world as other countries are looking at this space more aggressively too. So my thanks to all of you for that. My thanks to all of you for coming today. I was asked to talk a little bit about sort of the cyber dimensions of the war between Russia and Ukraine, and I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do it sort of trying to place it in a little bit of historical context for how we think about the evolution of international cyber conflict over the course of the past 15 or 20 years. When I, when I do history, it really only goes back a couple decades because I don't start much before the beginning of the internet. Um, but I want to sort of talk a little bit about that history because I think it's important to understand where our ideas and expectations for the cyber dimensions of this conflict came from. Right, what, what the kind of context was that had people like me making sometimes very incorrect predictions about what was going to happen in Ukraine um, from the cybersecurity side. And then talk a little bit about what we've actually seen over the course of the past few months and what we might learn from that. How we might start sort of reevaluating, reassessing our ideas about what Russia is capable of, about what the rest of the world is capable of. Um, and I think one of the points that I want to make and, and that I always want to make when I talk about international cyber conflict in the capabilities of various countries, especially Russia, which we're going to talk about a lot today, is that a lot of this is sort of historically based guesswork. A lot of what we mean when we say, you know, Russia can take Ukraine offline like that is they were able to do it in 2015 and in 2016. And that's sort of where our expectations and our ideas about those capabilities come from. Because often it's very, very hard, as Sanjay just mentioned, to sort of Feel confident you know what the cyber capabilities of another country are. Those aren't visible things. Those aren't tested in sort of physical ways that we can see. So I think that history is really important. I think sort of rethinking it and rethinking our ideas about what various countries can do over 
the course of conflicts is hugely important. And then finally, I want to sort of take a few minutes to put this in the context of the ongoing, now almost 20 years long saga of different countries trying to develop global cyber norms, um, which, as you just heard, is, is a slow and painful one. Um, and, and I don't have anything incredibly hopeful to say about it, except that I think it highlights a little bit why the work you do at the state and local level is so important. Because what's happening at the sort of international organization level is a very slow and ponderous process. And I want to believe that it will get somewhere. But I know it's not going to get somewhere very fast. And in the interim, that's why the, the sort of security controls and measures and policies that all of you are implementing are so important. So I want to start in 2007, which is where a lot of sort of classes on cyber conflict and, and discussions of the history of it begins, which is also a moment when Russia kind of comes on the scene in a really big way, not just as an entity with certain cyber capabilities, but, and I think this is one of the most important things when we talk about Russia and what makes it different from other countries, as a country that is willing to do things that many other countries are not. Um, that, that is willing to sort of cross some of the boundaries and set some of the precedents that certainly the United States has been really reluctant to, to set and, and other countries as well. So in 2007, many of you may remember this, there are these really massive distributed denial of service attacks on Estonia. Um, and it's in the context of a sort of ongoing geopolitical conflict between the two countries, a conflict about the, the movement of a memorial statue in the center of Estonia that's uh, honoring fallen Soviet soldiers and and there's you know, tension between the two countries for that reason. And one of the things that you often see when we talk about international cyber conflict is this attempt to sort of not just perform attribution, but also understand the magnitude and the, the motivation for these types of cyber attacks in the context of existing conflicts. Right, The idea that cyber attacks aren't just a, a separate thing that happened between countries unrelated to the other geopolitical tensions, but really deeply embedded in what's going on in those countries already. We rely on that information more than I think a lot of people realize to sort of do this kind of attribution work to say, here's who we think is behind this kind of cyber attack. Um, and it's, it's something that sort of continues even to, through to today as the forensics get better, as we have sort of the ability to do stronger attribution in many ways. In 2007, a lot is hinging on the sense that like, who would want to go after Estonia right now? There, there really only seems like one actor that would, would be interested in taking Estonia offline. It looks like, um, as, as distributed denial of service attacks always do, it looks like just millions of packets bombarding the servers for Estonian banks, Estonian newspapers, Estonian government agencies, whole country sort of unable to get online for a lot of resources for a period of a couple days. They call together the network operator groups at some of the big internet exchange points in Europe. And basically, for a while, just shut down all traffic coming into Estonia from other countries. They say, you know, we can't, we can't distinguish between the malicious traffic and people who might actually be trying to get to these web servers legitimately. Let's just shut it all down and sort of try to get things back online. Um, it, it works OK, right, as a sort of in the moment mitigation, but it feels, especially to folks in Estonia, like this was, this was something akin to an act of war. This was sort of a conflict, the likes of which we haven't seen before in cyberspace. I mentioned this question of attribution, right? When we talk about this incident now, we talk about it as something Russia was responsible for. A lot of that is about sort of the tensions between the two countries in the moment. Some of it is about sort of the instructions for how to do this. So there are online forum postings. This is a screenshot of one of them that are in Russian that are sort sort of telling people, hey, if you want to join in the denial of service attack, if you want to be bombarding Estonian servers as well, here are some instructions for how to do it. And coming back to the comments about sort of, is this a teenager? Is this a state-sponsored attack? One of the other things that's really sort of starting to become apparent at this moment, 15 years ago or so, is that those aren't necessarily completely distinct entities. That you can have governments and state-sponsored initiatives, and that they can sometimes perhaps even be harnessing the computing power, the technical expertise, the resources of individual people in the country. We see sort of the evolution of that in Russia um, in terms of the collaboration between the government and some of the large cyber criminal organizations. And so the question of sort of who's attacking you, is this actually coming directly from the government? Is this coming from individuals within this country? How do we make those distinctions? Is already a hard one 
15 years ago is already something that people are sort of struggling to figure out in various ways and relying on you know, what we would probably generously call fairly circumstantial evidence, stuff like this, saying, well, you know, these postings are in Russian. So that seems, that seems like a good clue. We know there's, there's some tensions between these two countries. We know that we sort of see some IP addresses that look like they're coming from Russia. Um, though because it's a distributed denial of service attack, you've also got traffic coming from, from devices all over the world, and that's going to be true of a lot of the later attacks as well. And the things I want to sort of make, make clear about this early attack on Estonia, first of all, it's incredibly public. Right, so you compare this to sort of the stuff that we later learn China begins doing around this time and continues doing for another seven years. That's a very sort of covert form of cyber espionage. That's all about not just stealing information, but doing it in a secret enough way that nobody notices you for ideally years and years. This is meant to cause a splash. This is meant to sort of get people's attention um, to show some of the kind of capabilities or, or dominance in cyberspace that we know Russia likes to signal. Um, it's also not a particularly technologically sophisticated attack. And, and we use that word a lot in the cybersecurity space, sophisticated. And I think what, what I usually use it to mean is this is not an attack that requires any hard won, carefully discovered vulnerabilities or sort of zero days or, or anything even close to that. This is just, we've got a lot of devices sending packets to Estonia, taking them offline. Um, and I think that's important for thinking about this current conflict as well, because over the course of sort of the 10 years that follow these attacks on Estonia, Russia's going to develop an increasingly sort of exalted reputation for sophisticated cyber capabilities, for the ability to find these vulnerabilities that nobody's found before, to exploit them in, in sometimes really sort of large scale and damaging ways. And that's not quite what they're doing in 2007. They are doing something really public and something really damaging, but they're exploiting techniques that they are able to you know, send out on forums to whoever wants to download some scripts and, and run them themselves. And the last point I want to make about this is that this feels different in 2007. This feels like something we haven't seen before. This is the statement from the Estonian foreign minister a couple days later. The European Union is under attack because Russia is attacking Estonia. The attacks are virtual, psychological, and real. Right? They're trying to make this point, which is a, a harder sell more than a decade ago than it probably would be today. Don't dismiss this just because it's happening online. This is something that has a real impact on daily life, that has a real economic impact, that is as real an attack as anything else we've seen. And I think that is also sort of something you're going to see more and more countries coming around to in the years that follow this. But because it's the first one, because perhaps sort of on the scale of some of the cyber attacks we've seen since, it is not as damaging, it's not as long lasting. I think it's a little bit of a, a tougher argument for Estonia to be making in that moment. You see here they're invoking NATO a little bit, right? They're saying this is the European Union that's under attack. There are discussions at the time when this is happening. Should we be invoking the NATO Article 4? Should we be actually sort of thinking about collective response here? Um, and I think what happens then, and it's happened many times since, is there's sort of the sense of, oh, it doesn't quite hit that threshold. Right? It's, it's serious, it's new, it's not that serious. Um, but it's a conversation that you sort of see NATO continuing to have. You see people in all of these countries continuing to think about and trying to sort of send some public signals, well, maybe not this attack, right? Maybe this was not uh, an act of war, but it could happen. It could be a cyber attack, which of course then prompts the question of, well, well what would that look like? And what is the threshold we want there? I want to zip through sort of a, a few more years of history of Russia and cyberspace. And I I have to touch on cybercrime because it's, it's such a big piece of what they're known for. In my world, this is the wanted poster that the FBI mocks up in 2013 for Evgeny Bogachev, um, who is the Russian cyber criminal behind the Game Over Zeus bot, which is known for lots of sort of financial cybercrime, especially dis the distribution of the crypto locker. Malware, which is one of these sort of early very successful ransomware strains. And Bogachev is somebody who we think is sort of primarily financially motivated, is primarily interested in finding ways to steal money um, and uses ransomware along with various other tools, stealing credentials for bank accounts and stuff like that to do this. This is a screenshot of the crypto locker uh, lock screen after it encrypts people's hard drives and says to them, you have to make a Bitcoin payment to get your information back. Makes 
tens of millions of dollars doing this, probably hundreds of millions of dollars in total between that and stealing people's bank account credentials and initiating fraudulent transfers. Very lucrative business, right? And, and one of the things that sort of makes the cybercrime piece very difficult to disentangle from the international cyber conflict piece when we talk about Russia is the economic component of it, the number of jobs, the amount of money that's coming into the country from this sort of activity. And so you see these cyber criminals operating, I would say, sort of at large scale, beginning a little bit more than a decade ago in Russia. And right from the get-go, you see a, a fair bit of reticence on the part of Russian law enforcement to cooperate with international partners to help sort of do any of the investigations, certainly to help arrest them after the, the actual indictments are filed and um, the, the demand for that is in play. Um, but there's also this interesting component. He's a guy, by the way, who likes expensive cats and boats. So if you're wondering what he's doing with those hundreds of millions of dollars, we actually have some idea. We have some photos. Um, he's, not, he's not living his life underground. He feels pretty comfortable that the Russian government isn't going to arrest him and, and extradite him to the United States. And and a big part of that, and again, this is, I think, sort of where that, that interconnection comes in, is that we believe that he's also, or his organization, is also sharing information from the computers that they infect with the Russian government. That even though this is kind of primarily something we might categorize as financial cybercrime, there is an espionage component. There is sort of some support for state-sponsored attacks. Um, and, and that, I think, is a really sort of crucial piece of understanding the capabilities Russia has and also some of the limitations in terms of thinking about how do we work towards a world where there is more partnership, where there is more consensus around what the global cyber norms are. Because if you can't get Russia on the same page as the United States and many other countries about the idea that somebody who is distributing ransomware and initiating fraudulent bank transfers is a criminal, that that is the sort of malicious cyber activity that we want to discourage and police, then you really don't have a sort of shared Base for starting to negotiate more controversial or more complicated norms about targeting critical infrastructure or civilian casualties and damage or anything else. And the other piece of this that, that I think sort of really complicates this is the sense that even though these aren't people who are directly employed by the Russian government, even though this is sort of a separate enterprise, it is still very closely linked in many ways. And that's not unique to Bogachev. There are more recent indictments as well that many of you may have seen of two other the Russian cyber criminals, Maxim Yakubets and Igor Toroshev, that actually make that connection even more explicit in the indictments, talking a little bit about sort of the ways in which these men work with the Russian government, and even getting into sort of some of the family ties. This is Maxim Yakubets' wedding to the daughter of a very high-ranking um, Russian intelligence official outlined in red here. So the, the sort of levels of connection and protection are really quite deep and quite powerful in a lot of ways. And even, even when we sort of try to sort out what are the ways in which we think we can reach common ground with different countries, maybe if we talk about crime and not various kinds of conflict, maybe if we talk about, usually crime is the one we go to, you know, let's not touch espionage, that's really hard, let's not touch sabotage, that's also really hard. Even when we talk about sort of the things that we think should be shared values or shared ideas about malicious behavior in cyberspace, it's really hard. It's very, very kind of complicated to separate that out and say, let's come to an agreement about part of this and, and leave aside some of the trickier pieces. They're all really tricky pieces. They're all very integrated and nowhere more so than in Russia. Nowhere more sort of impossible to say, can we at least agree on some of the basics of cybercrime policing and norms? So I want to sort of talk a little bit about disinformation because that's also a piece that, that's pretty central to how we think about Russia's cyber operations. Um, it's, it's a big topic and one I'm certainly not going to do justice to in this time. But as we think about kind of the different components of what we've seen Russia do in this space over the years, there's this evolution from sort of large scale disruptive, not terribly technically sophisticated attacks like the one we see in Estonia to a real emphasis on cyber Cybercrime starting a few years later. We're going to steal a lot of money. We're going to spread malware very widely and use it largely for these kinds of financial fraud 
um, or extortion. And then beginning sort of around the 2016 election is certainly when it becomes uh, an emphasis in the United States, there's more attention to this question of, well, what about these information operations? What about the ways in which sort of malign influence is becoming a priority for Russia? And, and that, again, sort of shifts the conversation about what are the capabilities that Russia has in this space and what are the motivations and goals. This is from one of the indictments. The United States issues two indictments of Russian actors following the 2016 presidential election. Um, sort of talking about two different kinds of influence operations. Uh, one is thinking about sort of the purchasing of, politi of political ads on platforms like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. These are some of the examples from the indictment of ads that are being purchased by Russians posing as Americans, right? Stealing identities and, and stealing the, um, the bank accounts or PayPal accounts in many cases in order to purchase these. Um, and that's, that's if you actually sort of look at the criminal charges, kind of the heart of the crime is the identity theft piece because Posting ads on Twitter is not in itself a crime, but there are certain restrictions around political advertising. So you start to see sort of some of the, the attempt to pin down what is happening here. That's not just unwanted, but also illegal. And then there's another indictment that's sort of really focused on the hacking efforts around the 2016 election, the breaches of the Clinton campaign, the DNC networks, um, trying to understand sort of how that type of intrusion also fits in to these malign influence operations and, and how that kind of fits into our larger picture of what we think Russia wants to do with its cyber capabilities and what it's using them for. And here I would say we see in terms of technical sophistication a little bit of a mix, right? A little bit of sort of some very basic, we've stolen some people's PayPal accounts and, and identity information information um, and used it to post some ads online with some slightly more sophisticated, we've managed to get into various people's email accounts, we've run some spear phishing campaigns, stuff like that, and, and less of a sense that sort of this is a, a, an adversary that's doing something totally different from what other adversaries are doing, but more they've kind of picked up a little bit of the playbook we've seen around, say, phishing from China or other countries where there's perhaps a little bit more convergence yeah, with them and, and other actors in this, this space, except, again, for sort of how public they are, how not interested in remaining covert they are in many of these operations. And again, that willingness to kind of push the boundaries and say, even though this isn't something we've exactly seen other countries do yet, we're not particularly worried about the precedent we might be setting. We're not sort of as cautious as the United States, for instance, is around these things. And I think by 2016, you could make the argument, they've, they've looked around and said, we're pretty confident that this is something that we're, we're not going to regret doing because we've been testing out various forms of cybercrime and cyber sabotage for a while and haven't seen a lot of consequences from that. And things really escalate. Um, to my mind, uh, around that 2015, 2016 moment, you get these really significant attacks on Ukrainian critical infrastructure. Um, when, we, when we say sort of, you know, okay, the distributed denial service attacks in Estonia don't hit the threshold for, for triggering NATO collective action, but something might, and then somebody pushes you on, well, what's the something? Usually the something is like, well, you know, if the whole electric grid went down. And that, you know, that's the, this is the closest we've seen to that kind of attack is what happens in Ukraine first in late 2015 and then again in early 2016, where Russia actually does find fairly sophisticated technical vulnerabilities. And again, by sophisticated, I just mean nobody's found them, nobody's thought to protect them before, and takes advantage of them to shut off power for thousands of people for a period of several hours. Um, it's, it's a sort of startling thing for a lot of people in my space who had kind of assumed that many countries or a few countries had those kinds of capabilities but were not interested in exercising them. Um, and, and again, it's that moment where you see Russia willing to go places that nobody else has really gone before and able to go those places, right? Not just, not just interested in wreaking that kind of havoc which say we might think North Korea would be willing to do, but also with the technical skills and, and tools to back that up. And then in 2017, you get probably the best known Russian cyber attack, not Petya, 
uh, which comes that summer, exploits the eternal blue vulnerability. There's a lot of fights about sort of how technologically sophisticated this attack is because on the one hand, it's a very sophisticated vulnerability, and on the other hand, it's stolen from the United States government. So one of the things people talk about in the context of this current conflict is sort of, is Russia able to find vulnerabilities on its own? Right, or is that something where, where they've always perhaps been a little bit more dependent on what they can steal? This is from Andy Greenberg's uh, cover story for Wired about the NotPetya attack, the code that crashed the world. It's you know pretty much by everybody's estimates, and even as as kind of hand wavy as these estimates usually are the most expensive cyber attack we've ever seen. It begins in Ukraine. It's initially distributed using Ukrainian accounting software. But because of the connections those computers and businesses in Ukraine have with computers and businesses all over the world, it spreads pretty quickly. It affects a lot of companies all over the world, including in the United States. Um, you see, again, sort of that that hit on Ukrainian critical infrastructure, energy companies going down. But at that point, that is sort of a, a small part of the story, at least from the, the global perspective, because you've got companies that aren't even sort of based in Ukraine, aren't even really located there in any meaningful way, shutting down operations for weeks at a time. You've got Maersk and shipping, you've got Merck and pharmaceuticals, you've got Mondelez and food, you've got thousands and thousands of victims and servers going down. This is a map that ESET put out, just kind of mapping where the infections of NotPetya are to give some sense of this spread globally. And I think one of the things that sort of people are really scared of in, in the early months of 2022 is this apparent total disregard for collateral damage. <laughs> by Russia, this sort of apparent willingness to spread malware that even if it's kind of targeted a little bit at Ukrainian computers is not bounded in any significant way, is not actually sort of trying to restrict itself or, or prevent or sort of stop its spread across the rest of the world. So when you see sort of the warnings coming out of the Department of Homeland Security, the, the shields up type stuff, I think that's partly about worrying that Russia is going to target the United States specifically in retaliation for sanctions, but also partly just about this concern that when Russia launches cyber attacks, they're often not well bounded. They're often sort of done with a disregard for how widely could this spread, how much damage could this do worldwide. Not Petya, for those of you who, who've blocked it out of your memory, for which I would not blame any of you, has this kind of weird hybrid ransomware sabotage model in which what actually shows up on your screen looks like a ransomware message. It looks like uh, pay us $300 in Bitcoin and, and we'll restore your systems. But in fact, we quickly learn it's not ransomware at all. There's no way to restore the systems once NotPetya has wiped data off of them. And on top of that, actually, it turns out there's not really any uh, infrastructure underlying the ransom demand either, right? There's an email address in here you're supposed to email once you've paid your ransom to get your decryption key back from the criminals. Turns out very quickly, actually, there's, there's no such email address. You can't get that information. So pretty early on, this starts to look like something that's not traditional ransomware. This starts to look like something that can't really be financially motivated if there's no way for people who make these payments to get back their information. And again, people start sort of asking very early on. Could this be related to a nation state? Who would be behind this? Um, and the attribution cycle, which has improved a lot, by 2017 from where we were in 2007 when we were talking about Estonia is partly focused on this question of who has motivation, is partly focused on sort of what does this code look like? Is it similar to malware we've seen coming from particular places before? Um, it is much more coordinated than anything we've seen prior to NotPetya. So there have been cyber attacks that have been attributed by governments. Uh, the first one in the United States, Sony Pictures. The US government kind of comes out and makes a public statement a couple months after the big Sony Pictures breach saying this was North Korea. We're pretty confident. What happens in this case is much more international than that. You have one week in February of 2018 when a whole bunch of countries all release coordinated statements saying we think Russia was behind this. This is a screenshot of the UK National Cybersecurity Center. Um, they make one of these statements. We Almost certainly, the Russian military is responsible for the NotPetya attacks in 2017. Um, you have the White House press secretary making a similar statement that week. Uh, in June 2017, the Russian military launched the most destructive and costly cyber attack in history. This attempt to sort of say, 
look, this is, this is not something where we want people to be saying, oh, you know, attribution in cyberspace, nobody really knows how to do it, could be Russia, could be anybody. We're all, we're all on the same page here. We're all going to say sort of this is what happened and this is who was behind it, which sets the stage, I would say, for, for a lot of the really interesting insurance fights that come out of this. Because once you have a whole bunch of countries saying this was definitely Russia, it, it opens the door for the discussion of, well, in that case, was this cyber war, as war is sometimes defined in these insurance policies as being a kind of nation state sponsored activity or attack. Um, and, and then kind of triggers a whole set of disputes over, well, who's going to pay for this costly cyber attack in history? So the history that kind of brings us up to the point of the war in Ukraine that's going on right now is a history in which Russia is pretty unconcerned about who gets affected by their cyber attacks, is pretty willing to attack critical infrastructure, certainly in Ukraine, is, is pretty willing and pretty able to attack critical infrastructure, and is not at all concerned about sort of some of the, the guardrails that the United States and other members of the international community have been pushing for almost a decade at this point around sort of let's, you know, target cyber attacks, let's make sure that there's not any unnecessary damage, let's try to keep them restricted from very various kinds of civilian targets so that it's not taking out hospitals in the middle of a pandemic, say. Those are not areas where we've sort of seen Russia particularly interested in, in adhering to that type of norm. And what's kind of interesting and kind of surprising about what happens over the past several months is we don't see any cyber attacks that kind of reach the level of NotPetya. We don't see anything, certainly this successful, perhaps this sophisticated coming out. And there are a lot of different interpretations for sort of what that, what, what's going on there. We certainly see cyber attacks, right? It's not a, a complete absence, but we see cyber attacks that look a lot more like what happens in 2007 in Estonia than 2017. Right, we see cyber attacks that look like denial of service attacks on Ukrainian government websites. We see some wiper malware sort of deleting information off of those servers. We see uh, some defacement of government websites, right? Stuff that's disruptive, but not, not kind of disruptive at the scale that we fear Russia is capable of. Um, and we think a big part of that is sort of ramped up defensive efforts, including international assistance from NATO, from the United States trying to provide Ukraine with intelligence about what's coming, trying to provide them with technical tools and strategies. There's also, I should say, a sort of huge private sector component of that, right? When, when Ukraine realizes that Russia is about to invade, a couple cloud companies basically get all of their government infrastructure on the cloud in a matter of about a week, maybe two weeks, which is, if any of you have ever tried to migrate a state government service or department to the cloud, you know a very, very shortened timeline for trying to make all of that happen. So there's a huge amount of coordinated effort here. There's also, I think, arguably a real degradation in the kind of technical expertise and skill set that we see coming out of Russia over the past couple months. And this is where I think, you know, people like me who've been working in this field and sort of making predictions or assertions about how competent Russia is in this space have to reevaluate some of, some of our thinking around the competence here. There are certainly some attacks. There are certainly some, some outages. But we don't see the Ukrainian power grid go down. That's partly because there's good defense. But it's also partly because there's not good enough offense. It's also partly because sort of that defense is able to stand up to everything that Russia is able to throw at them. There's a huge international component to this, right? In the United States, you've seen many of these warnings probably in the UK and other countries. There's concern Russia's going to do something that doesn't just affect Ukraine. They're going to do something that sort of takes out all of our computers worldwide. And again, that doesn't happen, right? We don't see the sort of not petcha like spread of a piece of malware all over the world. And again, I would say that's a combination of better defense, but also Russia not having anything that can get through that defense, Russia not being able to find the sort of vulnerabilities that are going to beat the, the patching efforts and the defensive efforts that are in play at the time. You also have sort of interesting discoveries around new wiper malwares, new, new types of weapons and techniques coming out of Russia over the past couple weeks. And those, those prompt some of the fights over, well, is there sort of a not Petya just lurking in the wings that never quite takes off? Um, and, and I think you could say that, right? You know, any, any new wiper malware that doesn't actually spread very widely could potentially have been something on that scale. But a lot really hinges on how deeply embedded and how widespread is the vulnerability 
that this, this malware program takes advantage of. And there, I think, you really see a weakness in Russia where we have not thought they had a weakness before in terms of finding those vulnerabilities and being able to exploit them before foreign intelligence can find out that that's what they want to exploit, before researchers can sort of seize and, and figure out how to patch the problems that this is taking advantage of. Um, there's also, I think, this kind of interesting dimension to, well, what about the non-state actors? Involved, and I mentioned there's you know a history in Russia of the government either collaborating with or sort of tacitly allowing various kinds of non-state actors in this space. During this conflict, you get that on both sides, right? You get non-state actors kind of joining in and including cybercrime groups saying we're for Russia. You also get non-state actors, including some cybercrime groups, saying we're against Russia. We're going to do everything we can to sort of take out their networks or steal their data and post it online at a scale that, again, I would say we haven't really seen in this kind of state-on-state -state conflict before. The, I don't know if they're quite autonomous, but certainly not, not following the direct instruction of any state group of people who are taking it upon themselves to do various kinds of hacking, to steal data, to take down computers and servers, and make sure that that's kind of happening, even if there's not a coordinated state-sponsored effort. There's also, I think, a, a really interesting discussion here about sort of why wasn't this the thing that people like me were predicting it to be? Why didn't the Ukrainian electric grid go down on day one? Farhad Manju in the Times writes a column about this, the cyber war that wasn't sort of, is this about Russia deciding we don't care very much about cyber capabilities in comparison to traditional warfare? Is this about them not having the, the talent and the expertise they need to pull it off? Um, is this about them keeping the sort of communications and electric networks up because they want the world to see what's happening in Ukraine? They want there to be a kind of shock and awe moment. Um, and I think, you know, all of this is, is as with everything that we, we do in the IR space, a little bit guesswork. I do think that as you see this conflict drag on longer and longer, it's harder to make the argument that Russia could shut down the Ukrainian power grid. They just don't want to. Right, that they're you know hoping everybody's going to see what's happening because it makes them look so good and so powerful, or they don't want to sort of target critical infrastructure in that way, and does tend a little bit more towards the defense is really working, the offense is really not as good as it would need to be to overcome those barriers. And I think in many ways that's that's a very hopeful story for the United States, the story in which our defensive efforts are perhaps a little better than we've counted on them being, and the offensive sort of adversarial attacks are not as sophisticated, not as surprising, not as difficult to anticipate as we might have feared. Um, there are a whole bunch of sort of political scientists who get in on this space and sort of think about why Russia's not relying more on cyber warfare here. Uh, as I say, a lot of that is kind of about trying to understand, is this something that has lost a little bit of its shine? Is this something that sort of, when it comes to actually taking over a country, is not super useful or is really hard to coordinate with traditional warfare? And therefore, kind of once the, the warfare starts, the cyber piece dies down. One of the things that these researchers in particular point to is the kind of chronological progression here, in which you have some very early attacks on Ukrainian government websites before the actual warfare starts, and then it kind of dies down. Um, and whether that's about sort of priming the warfare or just trying to focus on the actual Connecticut uh, components once it begins, and therefore having fewer resources and, and fewer people to pay attention to the cyber dimension. Um, there's also, and I think this is you know, interesting, and I'm running out of time, so we won't spend lots of time on it, but a really important piece of this is the messaging that's coming out of the United States. Um, and its allies about the defensive efforts, right? That this is, again, a moment when the United States does not want to be totally quiet and totally covert about what it's doing. It wants some credit. It wants to be sending some signals about look at, look at our defensive capabilities, which we are generally not super well known for, um, right? The United States saying we've secretly removed malware. We've preempted Russian cyber attacks. Um, Ukraine announcing we've successfully thwarted, sophisticated, there's that word again, Russian cyber attacks on the power grid, trying to get the message out. Don't say this is just Russia's given up on cyber entirely, right, in response to that, like the cyber war that wasn't narrative. Know that there is stuff happening and we are successfully defending against it. And this has also been kind of one of the big open questions around cyber conflict is how do you measure success when success looks like nothing happening? How do you kind of, uh, 
signal or, or assess we, we actually did this effectively and not just we were up against an adversary that wasn't doing anything or wasn't doing anything very impressive. So I'm going to sort of skip through some of the academic nonsense at the end here and just wrap up with a minute on global cyber norms because I, I promised that at the beginning. This is a chart that comes from the Carnegie Endowment of Peace charting all of the different processes going back to like 2004, almost 20 years ago, that have been trying to develop some norms that all countries, but perhaps most importantly, the United States, China, and Russia could get behind and agree on in terms of how we do and don't use cyber capabilities uh, between states, starting with the UN Global Group of Experts, which is the earliest of these kind of sort of forums for, for organizing discussions, the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace, a couple of the sort of private sector rooted efforts when Siemens, Microsoft start to feel like the international organizations can't do anything, they're not getting anywhere, maybe Maybe it's time for us to step in uh, see if we can make any progress. You have the Paris call, which kind of builds on the, the tech accord to try and develop some agreements internationally between. This is a Paris call is an agreement that both companies and government entities can sign on to. So this kind of embracing of the multi-stakeholder model. And then most recently, the UN open-ended working group, um, which is kind of a parallel process to the other one, the UN global group of experts, where you now have two bodies within the United Nations both kind of working, I don't know if they would say they're working against each other, but certainly not working together to see if either of them could come up with any norms for cyberspace. And the final point I want to make here is that this is not work that is making progress at any speed at which we will be able to appreciate or enjoy its benefits in the next year or the next two years or the next four years. This is work that is going to be probably the work of a full generation. And because of that, the on the ground decisions, the on the ground defense that all of you are involved in, that all of you are supporting here today is even more critical because we, we hope we're going to get somewhere always in terms of getting leaders of states to agree. We we won't target critical infrastructure or things like that, but we're not there yet. I would say we're not even close to being there yet. You see new norms processes developing every couple of years as people feel like we should be able to get somewhere. Why can't any of these, these different groups make progress? And instead, what we're left with is, I think, a world where there are just fundamental differences of opinion, certainly between Russia and the United States, but other countries as well, about what is acceptable use of cyber capabilities, how those capabilities fit into existing ideas about international conflict, um, laws of armed conflict, and that in the absence of sort of some shared perspective on what that should look like, you end up with very difficult to predict conflicts, conflicts where our ideas about what countries and people have done in the past are not always reflective of what they're going to do in the future, reminding us of how important it is to always be updating our prior expectations, always be expecting a little bit the unexpected in this space. So let me stop there. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of this conference.